Hello, is. Oh, that's better. Can uh, everybody upstairs hear me? Yes, yeah, it's uh, turned on. Thank you for joining this session. Um, my name is Armin. I'm from the Netherlands in Europe. I'm here for the Linux Defenders program to talk about defense of publications. I work for Open Invention Network. Um, Linux Defenders is a part of Open Invention Network. Yesterday, my colleague Shane Coughlin, who's there up front, already gave a talk about what Open Invention Network does. For those of you who did not attend, Open Invention Network is an organization uh, built to protect Linux from patent threats by building a, a patent no-fly zone around Linux. We do that by, by um, having Linux stakeholders pledge non-aggression. Basically, they, we, we, they agree to not sue each other on Linux and, open, and various open source packages. But we also do quite a, quite a bit of other stuff because there are quite a few companies who do not like open source and actually do bring uh, patent aggression to the Linux ecosystem. So the core goals of Open Invention Network are limiting the patent threat and, if possible, removing it. So when we want to do that, there are three points in time where we can interfere in the process. Uh, we can do it after a patent has been issued, but that is very, very, very expensive. It could cost millions and millions of, well, basically any currency, euros of US dollar or US dollars. It's uh, something we'd rather not do. Instead, we would like to interfere earlier in the process because it's much cheaper and much more effective. Um, there are a few things going on in the world right now where as soon as someone, an entity, applies for a patent, then basically everyone can just submit prior art to have the, uh, the patent and to have the patent claim removed or at least reduced. But um, there's also a, f a very cheap and very effective method, w which I will talk about today, which is called a defensive publication. Basically, it's documenting prior art and getting it in front of the patent examiners. That's all it is. Very cheap, very effective. And it could be a um, way to ensure that patents are never granted. So to put it in context, I want to, want to tell a little bit of history. Uh, in the last few years, there have been quite a few patent lawsuits, uh, quite a few high-profile patent lawsuits that uh, involve Linux. They were mostly in the mobile and embedded space. For example, Microsoft versus TomTom a few years ago. Microsoft versus Barnes & Noble and Microsoft versus Motorola. Now, there's a lot of Microsoft there. I do not want to single out Microsoft, but they are a, well, they are a very visible um, opponent to Linux and open source, and one of the ways they, they are battling it is via patent lawsuits. So these lawsuits, uh, they were about not just a single patent, but about a few patents, including the one about the file allocation table or FAT file system. Um, some, most of these companies are tech companies, except Barnes & Noble. Uh, Barnes & Noble, that's actually an interesting one, because they're a bookshop. So even they're, they're, not, they're not a software company or a hardware company. They're a bookshop. They sell books. But the, the paper market, so for physical books, that market is dying. In 10 years, uh, probably not many books will be sold. So they're moving into the digital uh, sphere, and they have the Nook tablet. And the Nook tablet was running Android and very, very successful. And Microsoft thought, no, we don't like that. So we're going to sue you for patent infringement. And the other companies like TomTom and Motorola, they have patents themselves. So they could just go to Microsoft and say, hey, but you're violating these patents. So what they do, they settle, cross deal, done. Barnes & Noble, no, they don't have any patents at all. They're a bookshop. What can you patent about books? Not much. So what happened is uh, Barnes & Noble, they, they got very, very upset and tried everything in court, but it was not successful. And what happened? Um, they settled out of court, and a few weeks later, the, uh, they announced a strategic partnership. And the next version of the Nook will no longer be running Android. So it's not just about money that, that companies like Microsoft are suing for patent infringement. Sometimes it's about market access. So as said, it's, not, it's never about a single patent, but always about a collection of patents. And you know, would these lawsuits have happened if these patents were never issued because there was prior art? Probably not. So the Microsoft FAT patents, they, are, they were um, 
it's, it's especially about the VFAT thing. For those of you old enough to run MS-DOS, you probably heard about the 8.3 notation. So the maximum of eight characters in a file name plus a three-letter extension. That was very limiting. So they made an extension where you could have a ma magic cookie at the end of the file, which would indicate the file name is actually longer. So, but you need to look somewhere else. And they applied for a patent, and it was granted two years later. And they used this in, uh, in all kinds of court cases. Many companies tried to fight them and to, to, to have the patent invalidated, but it didn't work, and it, that actually strengthened the patent. So, you know, all these companies, they, tr they gave it their best shot. Uh, the judge said, no, it must be a really good patent. And it led to a lot of patent aggression towards other companies. But it was not innovative at all. In 1992, Linus Torvalds uh, described a similar solution for this problem for the Minix file system. It was posted on Usenet. That's for all you other dinosaurs. That was uh, popular before the web. And um, in 1992, he described the exact same thing. So Motorola found this Usenet posting. They went to the ITC, the International Trade Commission, which is not international, but just American. But that's a, <laughs> a completely other discussion. And the and an administrative law judge looked at this and said, that patent is no longer valid. So, so if Linus Torvalds would have, would have documented this in 1992, and when the, and, uh, the patent examiner would have looked at it, that patent would have never been granted at all. And there would have, well, one of the, one of the things, there would have been a lot less thought, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about Linux. So I mean, many people would, would not have felt unsafe about using Linux. The lawsuits might never have happened or might have been a lot less visible. And in short, it would have been a lot easier for these companies to feel safe about using Linux. So software patents, uh, well, they exist, and they are often of bad quality. I'm, I'm not sure if you ever read one. Uh, I'm an engineer, so I've, I've, I've read a few, and they're in, sometimes infuriating simple. You look at it and like, what? They got a patent because of this? Come on, it's trivial. And often, there are also lots of prior art. Uh, there are tons and tons of duplicates of patents that are about the same technology and describe the same idea. Or they're very, very vague, and they apply to almost anything. The reason is the patent examiner. Patent examiners are technical experts who have to read through all these claims and then say, yes, this is innovative, so a patent can be issued, or say, no, this is not innovative, so it it uh, should not be, be granted. These people are completely overloaded. They have a lot of work. And they have about seven to eight, maybe 10 hours per patent. So when a patent comes in, they have, they have just a few hours to, to make that decision. And th those hours are not every time it, com it, it, it comes back from, uh, so a patent process is a back and forth process. You, you read the patent. Uh, you have a few comments. It's sent back to the uh, to the person who applied for it. Answers come back, back, and so forth. You don't have the ten, the seven, eight, or ten hours every time it comes back. This is in total seven to eight hours per patent uh, over a period of two years, something like that. It's it's ridiculous. So the patent examiners uh, they only use a very very limited set of resources to look uh, and determine if a, a patent is innovative. And there is a lot of good prior art out there that they simply do not see. To them, it's, it doesn't exist. It's dark matter. So what we should do is try to get uh, that prior art in front of them. A few examples of prior art that they do not look for are scientific publications. I mean, uh, some papers I cannot even read in seven to eight hours per paper, let alone a whole stack of them. Technical reports from universities. Uh, or the industry, conference proceedings, conference talk, blog posts, mailing list archives, you name it, uh, tweets, something like that. They, they simply do not have the time or resources. So defense of publications is what we, uh, what we came up with at the Linux Defenders program. Well, not just us, but many companies actually use it. And they are a way to make that dark matter visible and to, to uh, tell the patent examiners there is prior art, 
and this has already been documented. And defensive publications are quite simple. They're written like a technical report, not like a patent, but like a technical report. And we put them in a database on ip.com, and that database is searched by patent examiners worldwide. So the US Patent Office uh, searches it, EPO, the European Patent Office. I know that also the Patent Office in Taiwan and India and Japan and you name it. So everything, all the, all the uh, defensive publications we write, all the patent examiners actually see them. And so it's explicit prior art ensuring that you can safely use the stuff you came up with yourself without all of a sudden getting a nice letter from a lawyer, well not so nice lawyer, and not, not so nice letter from a lawyer saying you infringed on my idea. They're very easy and very cheap to write and they uh, prevent bad quality software patents from being granted in the future. We're not alone doing this. There are quite a few companies who are doing it. IBM, all the IBM Red Books are published uh, as defensive publications. And you will see, uh, see lots, of, uh, lots of them, Cisco, Microsoft, Lenovo, Motorola, you name it, also individuals. And some of these companies, uh, you might also see them on patent lists. Because it's not a, or you do, you do software patents or you do defensive publications. Many companies do both. Sometimes they have an, have an idea and say, you know, we don't want to have a patent on this, but we also do not want to be sued by another company because we, uh, we came up with it first. So they document it as a defensive publication and make sure the knowledge is out there. Writing a defensive publication is extremely simple. The only thing you need is a title, one or two pages of text, a maximum, describing how the idea works. How does the algorithm work? How does your ID work? How does the flow of the, of the data go? Something like that. And um, perhaps one or two figures describing the interaction. And that's it. That's a defensive publication. Then you submit it to us, we publish it. And um, it's not hard to write. If you can describe your ID in an email to a mailing list or a, or a blog post, or you can talk to someone and explain your ID when you're drinking a beer. I mean, if you can do that, you can write a defensive publication. It's really, really simple. And if you need help you, because you do not feel comfortable writing one, we will help you. No problem at all. We're already doing this with a few projects. Uh, so this summer we're going uh, on a bit, little bit of a tour of uh, conferences. Uh, about one and a half months ago, we were at the KDE conference in Tallinn, Estonia. Last month we were at Guadec, the GNOME conference in Spain. Right now we're at Coscop and we will be doing a few more conferences to talk to developers. And so far the responses have been very, very positive. So, of course, this is an example of a defensive publication. I do not expect you to read it, but just to show you the size of it, this is it. So if you, a title, a few paragraphs, and a figure. How hard could it be? Not hard, I think. So then the question is, when do I, when do, when do I write a defensive publication? Uh, this is something that many people ask me because they say, you know, I don't think this idea is innovative or uh, it's good enough to write a defensive publication about. But um, well, personally, I think that's, that's complete nonsense because it's always good to write a defensive publication. But as a rule of thumb, whenever you come up with an idea that makes you enthusiastic, when you cannot sleep at night, when you want to pick up the phone, tell all your friends, you know, I came up with this incredible idea. That's the right time to write a defensive publication. But you know, also at other times when you think, yeah, this could be fun, I think this could be useful, just write one. So, another question we got is, yeah, well, uh, so also during yesterday's talk, uh, 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 the talk that Shane gave yesterday, but should, shouldn't we fight about uh, you know, getting rid of software patents entirely? Well, that's a good, good goal, I think. But the patent system itself, it's not going away anytime soon. Software patents are just a small piece of the whole software patent system. It's increasing, but it's still a very small part. Um, if you say, you know, I do not like patents, so I'm not doing defensive publications because that's part of the patent system, that is a certain way, uh, way to lose. 
the, so the patent system, it's there in place. It's a reality. Deal with it. Even if you don't like it, deal with it. If you want to do the patent system, if you want to reform the system, which we are working on, that will take a long time. That will be decades. And even um, if we get a patent system reform, it might not turn out the way we want it to be. So I say, why don't we just fix things right now, current problems, and we worry about the future in the future. The uh, defensive publications are a way to fix the current problems today. And um, let me see. Also, if you do not like patents, prior art is a very good way to make sure patents are not, uh, are not granted. So if everything is prior art, then no patents will be granted. So if you like that idea, to start filing defensive publications like MAD. So, and if, if you want to eliminate software patents entirely, defensive publications, making existing prior art visible is the way to go. So, what's in it for you when you do it? It will only cost you a few hours of your time. But uh, what you get for it is a lot, because you get the freedom to operate around your own design, your own ideas. And uh, there will be fewer software patents that should never have been issued. Also very nice. We will give you a publication number for the publication in the database, so you can put it on your CV. So the database where we publish it, that's actually a, a digital notary. So it, it has been uh, completely certified and everything. And you can point at it and say, I wrote this. And also, very recently, um, they did not uh, arrive in time, but we have special nerd merit badges that you can put on your backpack and say, I wrote it, the defensive publication. They should have arrived at my home right now. Unfortunately, they were shipped too late. But at the next cost cup, I will have them. And all this is at completely no cost. So um, we, will, we will pay for it. So there, are, there is a little bit of cost with filing the publication, but we will pick up the bill. No cost for you at all. The website where you can find more information is linuxdefenders.org. And right now, I'm ready to ask uh, to to, uh, to take any questions if you have one. Any questions? If so, please use the microphone. Uh, thank, thanks for your sharing. Uh, is there some easy way to make sure my idea is upset, up, opposed or not? I'm sorry, I, don't, I did not quite uh, hear, hear the, uh, the question. So if you're, uh, if there is uh, any... I, I have an idea. I, I, I don't know my idea is opposed someone's idea or not. All right, so, 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 there... so if, an, if an idea is already someone's idea or not. Well, yeah. with a defensive publication, uh, basically you don't care. We do not do a patent search to see if this is an, uh, if it is an existing idea because it's not at the same level as a patent. It's not, it's not as, it's just one or two paragraphs. Software patents are usually a lot longer. So basically, um, you don't have to care. So you can just write it down, submit it to us, and then, uh, then it will be just fine. So just uh, come, uh, come up to me after my talk, and I'll explain it in more detail. Any more questions? So if you can speak in Mandarin, that's OK. I also have a question. Like, uh, okay, if I file a defensive publication and uh, it's it's already patented, so what will happen? Well, that uh, so the question is if there if uh, if I if you file a defensive publication and there's already a patent, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, basically, um, basically again, we do not do a patent search, so it doesn't matter. Okay. But uh, patents always do not always cover everything. To uh, it's usually up to a judge to decide whether or not a patent applies to a certain piece of technology. So it could very well be that a patent might, uh, might seem to apply to a broad, uh, broad range, but not everything, not the little part that you wrote a defensive publication on. I would suggest to not try to step, uh, to be on the judge's chair and take his position, because that's always um, a very dangerous thing to do. 
So I would just say, you know, um, don't care about it. Just write the defense of publication, file it, and don't worry about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. So it is, it is okay to file a, a file a pyro art based on a patent, is it? To file a defense of publication based on patents, well, you could do that, but uh, the patent would always have been issued earlier. So, um, filing a defense of publication in that respect would never harm. It's just uh, it can only help. If there's already a, a, an existing patent that applies, well, yeah, well, tough luck. But um, it could it could be that the defense of publication will definitely uh, just uh, make. Uh, future patent applications uh, go away. Well, not go away, but at least make them. Uh, I'll just say this. I'm at loss of words, jet lag. Um, <laughs> it will. It will definitely. It can only help. So it's a. Um, I would say uh, just do not worry about that at all. Just file defensive publications. Yeah, Shane. So just for the benefit of the room, oh, Shane Coughlin, Regional Director, Asia, Open Invention Network, I'm just about to cause our mind to have a miserable life. Just for the benefit of the room, you're here and you're available to sit down with everyone and help them do their first publication, right? That is correct. I'm yeah. here to sit down with people <laughs> to, uh, to make sure that they get the, uh, if, if you have an idea and you just say, you know, yes, I want, to, I want this to be a defensive publication, come up to me and we'll just sit down and just write one. We can do that. And some people, like I talked with a guy today, he had done a, a research publication and you could help work out what text needs to be like copy pasted into the... Yes, we actually have a uh, file defensive publication based on research papers and university papers. Uh, we, um, we've done that several times. Usually it is indeed a, a question of copy paste, changing the language a little bit and it can be done in under two hours. That's it. And you can make our mind do it. <laughs> and you can make me do it, yes. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, hi, Owen Tima. Any more questions? Okay, so thanks. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs>